-hmm. All right, it seems that we have uh, 15 attendees. Well, it's uh, the number is updating. Yeah, so we have, so we are around uh, 100 attendees right now. So I think it's a good time to start. Uh, so let me first share my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today for this weekly Polariton Chemistry webinar series. My name is Luis Angel Martinez and I've been honored to host today's webinar speaker, Professor Vinod Minon from the City College of New York. Uh, before jumping into our speaker's webinar, allow me to briefly share with you important information regarding the schedule and mechanics, mechanics of these webinars. As you may know, this weekly webinar series takes place every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So very importantly, you must sign up for each webinar you wish to join at the link shown here. And, uh, and which you can also find in social media. So make sure follow us for reminders and updated information. Also for convenience for, of everyone, we have set up a YouTube channel where, where, I will be post, where we will be posting the recording of webinars in case you miss one and want to see it later. We are glad to see the response of the community to engage in this effort to bring and discuss ideas with friends and colleagues, which is reflected in the attendance of over 150 participants from mainly from the Americas, Europe, and Asia at last week's week seminar. So we hope that this trend is sustained in the upcoming ones. Uh, finally, let me quickly explain the mechanics of the webinar. At uh, this point, I believe most of the audience is familiar with, with Zoom controls, but for the sake of uh, putting everyone on the same page, I will briefly review, review them here. During the talk, feel free to use the right hand button uh, the right hand button to ask questions directly to the speaker. When you raise your hand, I will interrupt the speaker and enable your mic so that you can publicly ask your question. In Q&A, you can type questions you may have during the talk and at the end of it, some, of, some or all of these questions, if time permits, will be addressed by the speaker. Finally, you can use the chat control to send messages to panelists and the audience in case you want to discuss anything. Importantly, for the sake of time, only questions in Q&A and those requested by raising hands will be addressed. So uh, with nothing more to add, let me introduce our today's speaker. Uh, Binod Minon is a professor of physics and currently the chair of the physics department at the City College of New York and doctoral faculty at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York or CUNY. He's a filio, fellow at the Optical Society of America and an IEEE Distinguished Lecturer in Photonics. He joined CUNY in fall 2004 as part of the initiative, if, initiative in Photonics. Prior to joining CUNY, he was at Princeton University from 2001 to 2004, where he was the Lucent Bell Labs postdoctoral fellow in Photonics. He received his Master of Science in Physics with Quantum Optics Specialization from the University of Hyderabad, India in 1995, and his PhD in Physics from the University of Massachusetts in 2001. He has held visiting positions at MIT, Max Planck Institute of the Science of Light, and Princeton University. He also serves as on the editorial board of Optique and OSA Journal. His current research interests include quantum simulation using condensates in solid state systems, cavity QED with two dimensional semiconductors, controlling transport and energies in organic molecules through, some, through strong light matter coupling and engineer nonlinear optical materials. So with that being said, uh, I'll invite, invite Professor Pino to, to, to share his screen. Um, thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and uh, thank you, Luis, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Wei and Hoel, for organizing this wonderful seminar series um, that is starting to garner a tremendous worldwide attention, if I want to say. Um, so uh, I'm from City College of New York. So good afternoon from New York City, where we are starting to finally see some slowing down in the crisis. Um, and uh, hopefully everyone who's joined us is all staying safe and healthy and wishing you all the best. Uh, with that, I'd like to start my seminar um, on strong light matter coupling in 2D materials. Uh, I'm also going to turn off my video um, so that if there are any bandwidth issues, it's not affected. So I'm going to talk about strong light matter coupling in 2D materials. And as I said, I'm from City College of New York uh, and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And we are um, funded primarily by the National Science Foundation, the Army Research Office, and the Department of Energy. Uh, we are also part of an NSF center, the Crest Ideals, and the, um, uh, some of the work was also done at the Center for Functional Nanomaterials. Uh, we are also funded by the NSF MERSEC program um, through the Columbia City College MERSEC Center. So um, the first thing I want to mention is um, when you talk about strong light matter coupling, we're talking about polaritons. And as the seminar series is called a polariton uh, chemistry. So the question comes, uh, so what we're going to really discuss is polaritons in 2D materials. So if you were to Google the word polaritons, this is what shows up. There's a Wikipedia entry and also one from Nature, both of which uh, capture the essential essence of what the word polariton means. Polaritons are hybrid star particles made up of photons strongly coupled to um, an electromagnetic, uh, strongly coupled to an electric or magnetic dipole carrying excitation. So if you um, think about it, the way you realize these polaritons is you have a material resonance. It can be an exciton, it can be a uh, phonon or it can be a charge oscillations and you hybridize it with a photon resonance which is your h bar omega a photon that is shown here and let me just use my pointer um, and so this is my h bar omega photon and this is my material excitation i hybridize it and i get the two new states which are called the upper and lower polaritons now the idea of polaritons have existed for a long time and this is just a quick history of uh, polaritons. In fact, the first description of hybridization between material excitations and photon was discussed in the context of phonons. And uh, this is, dates back to 1950s, uh, in the early 50s, where discussions on lattice vibrations and optical waves in ionic crystals by uh, Kuhn and then uh, Tolpiago's work, um, both of which describe phonon what we now know as phonon polaritons. And then about uh, seven to eight years later, there was the work uh, by Pekar, Hopfield, and Agronovich, um, all of whom are key players in this field, uh, who made key influences in this field, um, on the idea of electromagnetic waves coupling to material excitations or excitons. And uh, following that, about 10 years later, there was the description of coupling of photons with charge oscillations in metals, and that is the birth of plasmons and plasmonics as we know this. In some sense, all of these come under this community of polaritons uh, because of the hybridization between electromagnetic radiation and a material excitation. So why did I bring up all these contexts? Well, there's a really nice um, for, uh, article by Professor Basov and others um, on polaritons in 2D materials. And the reason I gave this historical perspective is because previously we thought of all these polaritons exist in different kinds of materials. So exciton polaritons in uh, semiconductors and plasmon polaritons in um, metals and so on. But what I want to show you here is that in 2D materials, you have all these kinds of polaritons to be uh, available. There are plasmon polaritons which are seen in things like graphene. There are phonon polaritons. There is a tremendous amount of work that's been done uh, by various groups on 
phonon polaritons in boron nitride and also in to some topological insulators. And uh, we have been doing a lot of work on exciton polaritons. We heard a little bit of that from last week's talk from uh, Professor Hui Deng. And there are two other kinds of polaritons that have been predicted. Um, and there are some preliminary experimental evidences in these directions on Cooper pair polaritons and magnon polaritons. Um, so in summary, the 2D materials presents a unique platform to explore the, at least to what is to my knowledge, the different kinds of polaritons that can be explored. And like I said, um, in this talk, I'll focus primarily on exciton polaritons. And so what are microcavity exciton polaritons? Just a quick primer uh, for those of you who attended the last week and the one before so webinar, apologies. Uh, but if you're joining this for the first time, um, a microcavity exciton polariton is a hybridized state that is created when you have an exciton, which is in a quantum well, hybridizing with uh, Bragg mirrors, which are on either side. And, uh, and the Bragg mirrors are from the cavity and so the cavity photon now hybridizes with the exciton and you get these uh, hybrid particles. The result of which is that this exciton, which is the dispersion of the exciton, which is shown by flat line and the dispersion of the cavity photon, which is shown by this curved parabolic curve. Um, these two hybridize resulting in two new eigenstates, which is the upper polariton and the lower polariton. And the splitting between these upper and lower polariton is called the Rabi splitting taking a terminology out of atomic physics. And uh, this, uh, these states are essentially these hybrid states, which have properties of both the exciton and the cavity photon. It's important to note that as, as a function of in-plane momentum, the, the contribution of the exciton and the photon to these branches change as a function of in-plane momentum. And in fact, the fraction of the uh, material X component and the photon component is given by the Hopfield coefficient. From an experimental standpoint, it suffices to say that looking at the angle at which this light comes out gives you indication of what is the in-plane momentum. It's a good map between the two. And so just by doing an angle resolved experiment, one can get the dispersion diagram that is needed to map these kind of systems. And typically the way you do these dispersion diagrams is you either do a real space angle resolved experiments or in some cases, uh, or in most uh, cases, I would say, we do a Fourier imaging where you image the Fourier plane um, and the back focal plane of the microscope objective, which is your Fourier plane. And then you just resolve it in energy and you get um, the, uh, mo uh, the energy momentum, uh, the momentum in plane uh, energy dispersion diagrams. So composite bosons. Composite bosons are half exciton, half photons. The excitonic component gives you the electronic response, scattering and nonlinearity. The photonic component gives you the small mass, spatial coherence, and the long range propagation. So you can see that you get the best of both worlds in some sense by, com by hybridizing these two. Most of the uh, work in the uh, early days was focused on realizing um, condensates. These are both Einstein-like condensates that can be created with these polaritons by pumping on these polariton branches and then they scatter and you get a macroscopic coherent state getting created here. Um, I want to emphasize that I don't call it a DEC because at least in most of the experiments that have been done, uh, the condensate is not thermalized. Um, and so it's out of equilibrium and the polariton number is not conserved. So you have to constantly drive the system. Now, the first experiment I have to give credit to the really the first experiment that was done in semiconductors, which was the work of Claude Weisbuch and uh, Arakawa, where they showed um, the strong coupling in a gallium arsenide quantum melts as a function of temperature. This is the original data from the 1992 paper. Following this, we have come a long way. And I want to just give a quick um, list. Uh, if I missed anything, my apologies. But I just want to separate between things that happen at cryogenic temperature, mostly in traditional semiconductors like gallium arsenide and 2,6 uh, materials versus things that have happened in the room temperature, which are in organic molecular systems and others. So in cryogenic temperatures, there's been a really um, amazing set of work, both at the fundamental level and at the application side. Fundamental level, um, like understanding things like thermalization of polaritons and um, vo vortex formations and superfluidity, and also more recently applications where uh, things like uh, Saniac interferometer and Mark Zender interferometers, nonlinear switches, 
topological polaritons, all of these have been um, demonstrated. And even polariton simulators, uh, which is one of the very recent work and uh, that has come out of uh, this field. On the room temperature side, so the reason why a lot of these work happened at the cryogenic temperatures was because the exciton binding energy in most of these gallium arsenide type semiconductors was on the order of few tens of MeV. So you need uh, to go above the uh, low temperature experiments to go to room temperature, one needed to go to systems which had, got la which had larger exciton binding energies. And that came in the form of organic molecular systems, uh, hybrid organic inorganic materials, zinc oxide, gallium nitride. Um, there has been some recent work on even single molecule strong coupling uh, from the group of Jeremy Bomberg um, and polariton chemistry, which is the topic of this, um, uh, which is the main topic of this seminar series, where there is, as we've seen, there's been a, uh, a lot of work on this topic recently that has come out. Um, and two new material systems that have recently emerged in the context of polaritons are perovskites and 2D materials, and both of which also show strong coupling at room temperature. And in fact, perovskites have also shown condensation at room temperature. So uh, just a quick overview of the kind of 2D material. So again, this is a chart taken from this review article. Uh, the ones that we will focus on are 2D chalcogenites, uh, which are molybdenum disulfide, tungsten sulfide, molybdenum selenide, and tungsten selenide, which are the ones that we'll work with. And, um, you know, why work with 2D materials? Well, besides the fact that you can get these um, supreme messages from New York Times um, about 2D materials, um, there is something really that is um, useful about that makes these 2D materials really unique in this context. So really, the, when we started this uh, effort in 2D materials, we had, had this question, why do exciton polaritons with 2D materials um, if, besides the fact that they are really popular and there's a lot of hype around them? So is there something really that makes 2D, uh, making polaritons in 2D materials really worthwhile? So to understand that, let's ask, what are excitons? So excitons, um, broadly defined in a textbook, can be given by 1A mod excitons and Frenkel excitons. So 1A excitons are uh, the, so I'm not talking about charge transfer excitons and so on. So here I'm just broadly classifying it in what is seen in inorganic materials and in organic materials. So the 1A excitons are where the electron and the hole are not located at the same lattice site and they can be described in a hydrogen atom like model and you can describe a Bohr radius and all of that. Frankel excitons are the excitons that are seen in organic material systems where the electron and the hole are sitting at the same molecular site. And so now they're extremely tightly bound. And but now a Bohr radius is not a well-defined quantity here. And so now, and then the band diagrams are as shown here. Uh, these are the conduction and valence band and the exciton energy is something slightly lower than the band gap energy. Um, and in this case, it's not uh, the, uh, the case. So excitons, 1A excitons and Frenkel excitons. The 1A excitons um, which exist in inorganic materials have large exciton radius, uh, 100 angstroms um, typically, uh, whereas in organic materials, they are localized at the same molecular site. Small binding energy, 10 to 60 milli electron volt. Large binding energy, 0.5 to 1 EV. Long range ballistic transport, um, whereas hopping transport is what happens in the case of organic materials. And then the condensation happens at low temperature, whereas in the case of Frankel exciton, it is not the case. Um, in the case of uh, Frankel excitons, um, it's a forced transfer or energy transfer that happens. There is condensation has been observed at room temperature or polariton lasing has been observed at room temperature in Frankel excitons. And there is small saturation density in 1A excitons and large saturation density in Frankel excitons. So why am I going through this exercise? So the reason I'm going through this exercise is to give you a feel for where the excitons in 2D materials sit. So let's look at excitons in 2D materials. Bohr radius is about 1.5 nanometers. And the um, binding energy is about 0.1 to 0.5 EV. And this also has a sensitive dependence on the substrate that we are using. And 
the uh, oscillator strength is given by here. Uh, the oscillator strength is shown. Um, so this is a graph taken by, from this, refer uh, this paper here. The black line is the absorption of graphene. The yellow line is a solar spectrum. And then what is shown here is the absorption spectrum of the different materials. What I want to highlight is at some of these exciton resonances, you can get up to 10 to 12% absorption. And this is not the case uh, with, so just to put things in numbers in perspective, in gallium arsenide, you get, it takes about, uh, or in silicon, you need about 50 times the same thickness to get the same amount of absorption. And this large oscillator strength stems from the orbitals that are involved in these transitions. And so inherently these materials have a huge strength in their interaction with light. Going beyond, because their binding energies are so large, it also translates to the fact that you can not only see the 1s excitons, but you can see 2s, 3s, 4s excitons in these systems. And that is because of the reduced dimensionality, the screening is um, strong in the layers and weak screening outside by the carriers because it's really a 2D material. In fact, you can see all the way up to 5s excitonic state in these systems. Oh, Professor? Yes. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Yes. So now, well, you can talk. Uh, so, sorry, we know a very nice yes. question. Okay, so yes. if I have just a monolayer of, say, uh, a, a very highly absorbing organic dye, how does that compare to uh, the absorption with respect to a 2D material? So, for at least from what I so I, I haven't seen a comparison of a monolayer of organic material absorption coefficient, so I, I don't want to answer that. But um, what I have a comparison against is in 1E excitons, at least, that I need about 50 times that thickness in silicon, which is the most widely used solar cell material. OK, and, and you said with respect to gallium arsenide, there's also something. It's, it's also, I don't have the exact range. number, but it's roughly on the similar ballpark. OK, thank you. So these excitonic states, which have been seen now all the way up to 5S, actually follow a um, Rydberg type uh, model, a hydrogenic atom model, and as you can see here. And they all lie in the plane. You can look at this with the Fourier imaging, and you can make sure that the uh, dipoles are all in the plane, and so on. So now if you ask the question, where do these excitons sit? The answer is the excitons actually sit somewhere between Vani and Frankel excitons with all their properties. but but you can still describe them within the one year picture because they have, still have a finite bore radius, which is a few atomic sites, um, as opposed to in the case of the Frankel excitons. So with this kind of an introduction, I want to now re, uh, revisit the question of why do polaritons with 2D materials? And I think the answers are the binding energy, the large oscillator strength, both of which makes it unique, but there are other materials that do it as well. And of course, then there is the other aspects of 2D materials, which we'll get to in a few slides. The idea of valley polarization or the valley properties, which are easily accessible in 2D materials, in 2D TMD, uh, transition metal dichalcogenides. And also the idea of charged exciton trions or Fermi polarons, which are a slightly different uh, idea, which is where an exciton gets energy, gets renormalized by the excess charges surrounding it. But the idea that there are these charged, um, these charged uh, excitons in these systems means that there is some degree of control that one can achieve with um, electrically. And then there is the added advantage that these materials can be stacked, um, as shown in this cartoon figure, uh, like Lego, Lego pieces. Uh, by and there is no question of lattice matching and so on. And there is a wide band, set of band gaps available. But you can also go beyond metal semiconductors and insulators as shown here, which is a hexagonal boron nitride as an insulator, graphene as a semi-metal, and the TMDs as the semiconductor. But you can also go to other classes of materials um, because there is a whole set of um, library available to do this kind of stacking and also get different band um, alignments and so on. So um, we're going back to 2014 when we started this, these efforts um, where um, we um, motivated by some work that happened in the group of Feng Yan Sha. Uh, we started looking at cavities with uh, TMDs uh, in between. 
In this case, the TMD uh, that we used was molydisulfide, which was grown by the uh, group of Yisha and Li um, at NTHU in Taiwan. And so we got the material sandwiched between two mirrors. We were not very familiar with the scotch tape business at that time. So we relied on the CBD grown samples and did a wet transfer and we put it between the two mirrors. And uh, what we saw was when we go to the region where the mirror, uh, where there is no 2D material, we just see the cavity resonance. And then when we get to the region where there is a, a 2D material, we get this splitting of the modes. You can map the dispersion very nicely, and you can also map the hop field coefficients, which clearly says the, in this case, the lower branch starts out more um, photon-like and then ends up more exciton-like, and in the upper branch starts more exciton-like and ends up being more photon-like. This work was spearheaded by my then graduate student, Xiao Zhe Lu and Zhang Sun. Um, Xiao Zhe is now um, actually just moved on from Berkeley to a faculty position um, in, uh, in Wuhan and Zheng is at uh, University of Pittsburgh. Um, I must say there has been a lot of work after, uh, for, uh, right after ours uh, from several groups. I've listed a few. If I've missed somebody, I really apologize for it. Um, I just wanted to give an idea that there has been different um, groups that are several groups that have been working on this uh, idea of strong coupling in 2D materials. I must also say that cavities are not the only thing in which strong coupling has been seen with 2D materials. There has been work um, with plasmonic lattices, um, and I list here three of the examples um, from three different groups which have shown strong coupling in 2D materials. In other words, the 2D material seems to be able to reach strong coupling uh, with not just um, traditional cavity systems, but also with open cavity systems, which have been used extensively in the context of organic materials, uh, which now can be translated to 2D materials as well. So um, the valley polarization. So the valley polarization property that I just mentioned um, uh, was, sorry, the valley polarization property that I just mentioned arises because of the broken inversion symmetry in these systems. And what this means is that because of the broken inversion symmetry, if I come with the right-handed circularly, so if I take the K and K prime, sorry. If I take the K and K prime values, if I come with sigma plus light or right-handed circularly polarized light, I can excite more carriers in this valley, which means that the light that comes out will also be sigma plus predominantly. And if I come with sigma minus light, I excite carriers in the K prime valley. And so more of, most of the light that comes out will also be sigma minus. What we wanted to understand was that if we create strong coupling with polaritons in 2D materials, do my polaritons also inherit this property? And as I mentioned, this property comes about because of the broken inversion symmetry in these materials. Um, and if you look here, what is shown here is the helicity as a function of angle. And this is the actual raw data, which shows that um, if I pump at the lower polariton, I get more of, if I pump with sigma minus, I get more sigma minus. If I pump with more sigma plus, I get more sigma plus. So this residual helicity that shows up is what is called valley polarization. And we are able to show that the polaritons inherit this valley polarization. What is even more interesting is that they also have a dependence on in-plane momentum because as you change the in-plane momentum, your excitonic fraction is changing, your photonic fraction is changing, and that changes, um, that affects the overall depolarization of this um, valley polarized polaritons. There have been very similar work from multiple groups, uh, from Sheffield, Wurzburg, Northwestern groups as well, um, on these uh, valley polarized polaritons, um, even in some cases where the valley polarization is found to be enhanced compared to uh, bare systems. This work was led by Zhang Sun, who was a grad student in my group at that time. Um, another aspect that we explored was long range propagation of polaritons. Uh, this was work uh, led by Stefan Kena Cohen's group and Daniel Esenveto's group, um, where they, uh, we wanted to look at polaritons um, that are propagating on using, uh, which are formed using uh -huh. block modes. So this is just a bottom DBR mirror, a distributed Bragg reflecting mirror. You have a 2D we know, I have also a quick question. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yes. Okay, so uh, compared to the excitons themselves, uh, do the polaritons have additional uh, depolarization uh, of yes, the Yes, because valleys? of the photonic component, actually uh, you end up losing it faster. 
Okay, but, by how much uh, more? Not, not end up losing it faster. It actually, because it loses fast, it, there is no time for it to depolarize. Wait, so because so then, the photons leak out fast, the information is out because of the cavity lifetime being short in these systems, uh -huh. right? Um, but I want to emphasize that the work from the Sheffield group, for example, showed that, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's the Sheffield paper that showed that you can actually get an increase in the overall value polarization in certain material systems. Uh, I'm, because of the photon escaping before the polarization? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, but then you show the opposite in your data, right? No, no, no. In our case also, uh, we show that um, the, so as it becomes more exciton-like, the helicity increases. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Good. Thank you. So um, the long-range propagation of polaritons, this was studied by the group of uh, Kenna Cohen and uh, San Vito, um, and we uh, provided the materials. Um, I just wanted to show you here that this is another open cavity system that is okay, where one can realize strong coupling. So this is just a bottom DBR. You have a block surface mode that is propagating on the top and you strongly couple that to the um, excitons inside the system. Um, and you can see here that you can get long range propagation of polariton. So this is where you have uh, just a bare block mode that's purely a photon like mode. And then this is the polariton which is strongly coupled to this block mode. And you can see that this goes over the crack. So you can get, um, and so there was a crack in this material and despite that, you are able to see the polariton propagate long distance. Um, again, the reason I put up the slide was just to show that there are open cavity systems that one can use to um, realize strong coupling. This brings us to another point that we, uh, one can do. Uh, because these systems can be easily electrically controlled, one can also realize micro cavity systems where you can do electrical uh, injection or electrical uh, doping. So what we did here was we have a 2D material with a contact and we gate it. And the whole idea was that as we gate it, what happens to strong coupling? So you can see here that um, you go from strong to weak coupling. Uh, if you change the gate voltage, you can go from strong coupling to weak uh, coupling because you're essentially putting more carriers into the system and um, your net oscillator strength decreases and you just basically go into the weak coupling regime. Uh, in our particular case, we did not see any uh, coupling, strong coupling to the trions. So we just see it returning to the weak coupling. So this was a nice exercise just to show how by introducing free carriers, you can actually control the um, strong coupling phenomena. And in fact, if you take a slice of the Rabi splitting point, you can see that you can go from a region that is highly reflective to highly absorptive uh, uh, region, depending on your gate voltage. Uh, this work was spearheaded by uh, my uh, postdoc, uh, Vishwanath, and a grad student, Jay, who then went on to uh, decide that, you know, if we can do electrical control of the charge doping, then can we actually make an LED out of this, an electrically driven device? So what is shown here is a bottom mirror with the, uh, the rest of the structure. So it's a boron nitride um, layer, graphene, boron nitride, tungsten sulfide, boron nitride, uh, graphene, and then a, a boron nitride capping it. We have two more layers of tungsten sulfide inside here, and that was done so that we have, we can increase the net overall oscillator strength of the excitons inside the system, uh, because when we do it with just one monolayer, the losses coming from the graphene actually affects the, um, makes the visibility of the polariton branches weak. So we had to add two, uh, two more layers in between. Ideally, you could make, put them also inside the electrically driven device, which would be the ideal situation. So here is the band structure of the device. So what we have here are, is a semiconductor tungsten sulfide. You have the two, um, uh, the two uh, uh, thin boron nitride layers. The thin boron nitride layers are uh, about uh, one to two nanometers thick and you have the graphene contacts that are shown here, and you can change the Fermi level of the graphene contacts by the bias. And by injection, you get the carriers to get injected, and then you get the recombination, and you get a photon out of the system. And that is the idea behind this device. The entire device was then encapsulated between boron nitride just to isolate it from everything else. 
So um, this is the IV characteristics. The turn on voltages are a little high. The reason they are high is because we have a thick boron nitride layer um, as the tunnel barriers, it was about two nanometers. We can reduce it even better if you go to a monolayer of boron nitride as our tunnel barriers. So this is the LED fabrication technique, uh, which is a standard pick and place technique. Um, so you start with the uh, thick boron nitride film, and then you use a dry transfer technique, um, polycarbonate based technique, um, and you pick up each layer, and then you get to realize that complete layer. As you can see in the final device, we had about 11 layers sandwiched between um, uh, on top of each other. And what is most crucial is that the electrical current has to flow through um, these layers so that you get proper electrical contact. And here we were using graphene as the contacts. So first to establish that we actually have strong coupling, we did a polariton LED experiment. Uh, we did a basic white light reflection experiment. We did photoluminescence and then an electrical injection. Um, and you can see that in the electrical injection, you get the bottom branch to be lighting up nice and uniform. In the PL experiment, because we are pumping non-resonantly, we seem to see some kind of a bottleneck effect at larger K. So here is, um, so all these images on the top are these Fourier images, Fourier plane images. So these are the K-space images, which is showing wavelength versus angle. Uh, what is shown in the bottom is uh, the real space image. And this feature is about two microns by five microns um, in size. So that's about the size of this emitting area. This is at low current density, this is at high current density. So you can see the thing electrically lighting up. The lesson we learned out of this is that it is, not too complicated to be able to realize an electrically driven device. And it also appears that electrically driving the device or charge, electrically injecting carriers into the system seems to favor populating the lower polariton at k equal to zero better than doing a PL experiment. This was about the directionality of this uh, device. The EQE of the device is nothing to uh, brag about. It's actually pretty low. It's about 110 to the minus three, uh, but it's comparable to some of the other electrically driven polariton devices that have been uh, demonstrated in organic and carbon nanotube based devices. This brings us to another uh, topic that is um, always been uh, of interest in the polariton community and what is the nonlinear polariton polariton interaction in these systems. And here I want to take a step back from the results and I want to show you um, something where which is slightly different from what one sees in most traditional 3.5 semiconductors, uh, which is Typically in most semiconductors, so this is your cavity polariton, upper branch and lower branch. And now when I have my, um, when I start yeah, professor? pumping it harder. Professor, I'm sorry? we have a question from the Yes, audience. go ahead. Matt, you can talk. Matt, hello. Uh, yeah, uh, I was wondering why the, uh, the, there was greater population in the lower polariton with the electrical injection compared to so it, well, the charge injection energy. seems to favor the scattering from the exciton to the uh, into the uh, lower polariton branch better than when you're doing a PL experiment, which is pumped higher up in energy. So it's a non-resonant high up injection pumping that we're doing in PL. But uh, why is it why is it favored? So when you're doing it uh, high up, the exciton, exciton relaxation is seems to get to the lower branch and doesn't get time to. Uh, scattered to k equal to zero. Whereas when you're doing electrical injection, you're injecting straight into the lower oh. polariton. Okay, I guess. Thank you. So and we have another question, actually. Yes. So, Barack, you can talk. Yeah, to follow up on the same question, under charge injection, there could be like some charge exitons, like trions, yes. can be formed. Yes. Like any insight on the effect of those uh, other exit? So we don't see any trion. Um, so I, that's a very good question. And in fact, if we drive the system very hard, we can start seeing some trion emission. And in fact, in some other devices that we made, uh, we were able to align the trion with the lower polariton. And in which case, the brightness actually can be made even higher when you drive it really hard. Okay. Uh, we have another question, actually. Yes. Ivy, you can talk. Uh, you should disable your... I can't hear you. Uh, you should disable your... You, you, you should label your mic, uh, Ivy. 
So sorry, I don't have a question. I accidentally pushed this button. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I just want to bring up something about this nonlinear polariton polariton interaction, which is that as you put more excitons into the system, the picture that we normally um, discuss in the case of the gallium arsenic polariton systems is one where the exciton energy is renormalized because of the exciton exciton interaction, and by which the lower polariton and the upper polariton both get shifted up. And typically, what is studied is the lower polariton. And we look at the lower polariton and we see a blue shift of the lower polariton and we conclude that this is because of this um, exciton exciton interaction that is happening and hence um, you're getting this uh, blue shift of the lower polariton. However, I must point out that in, especially in systems which have got large binding energies, um, there is another effect that can play an equally dominant role and that is one where uh, of phase space filling where essentially you decrease the number of polaritons that are involved in the process and because of which your overall Rabi splitting decreases. And this also shows up as your lower polariton branch going up. However, your upper polariton actually moves down because what you're really doing is decreasing the Rabi splitting. Both of these are nonlinear effects because they both depend on the intensity of the um, pump that you're using. And in summary, you can give your net susceptibility in some form like this, where in one case, you're shifting your exciton resonance. In the second case, you're actually affecting the net oscillator strength of the exciton. So there was a nice theory paper from the group of Thomas Paul and uh, led by Valentin Walter, who showed that we you can actually- Another question? Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Well, okay, so, sorry to bother you, uh, yes. but I, I found this interesting. So. Uh, have you experimentally seen any situations where uh, the both the, the exit and exit interaction and the phase space filling kind of cancel out so such that only the lower polariton uh, goes up in energy but the upper polariton just remains uh, in the same uh, no. range of energies? We haven't seen that um, and that's that what is... I'm going to get to. I'm going to get to that uh, whole what we see and how okay. we can't really separate one from the other but what seems to be happening in our case is this. Sure. So the group of, uh, you know, this is a theory work where they showed that if you increase the quantum number of the exciton, or in other words, think about excitons that are bigger and bigger, then the nonlinear, effective nonlinearity that you can get can be increased. And this is a theory plot that shows principal quantum number versus nonlinearity, where here the quantum numbers are really large, uh, which you can have in the case of um, the cuprous uh, oxide type on cuprous chloride type experiments that have been done. So again, going back to the question of TMDs, in TMDs also we can see these excited um, excitonic systems and the interaction strength goes as the square of the Bohr radius. So the question that we set out to ask was, if we can realize polaritons with one S state and two S state, will we see a difference in the polariton polariton interaction strength and will it scale as the square of the Bohr radius? And so to do that, we had to go to low temperatures because the 2s excitons have a oscillator strength which is about 10 times weaker than that of the uh, 1s exciton. So this is um, the differential reflectivity showing the 1s exciton and the 2s exciton. And this is, uh, you can see clearly the spectral feature um, associated with that. And so we made again a cavity structure. In this case, now we have three monolayers of tungsten selenide sandwiched between boron nitride layers. Um, this was work done in collaboration with uh, the group of Thomas Paul um, who con and Valentin Walter who helped us with the theory on this experiment and um, the experimental group from Tony Hines and Jim Hohn and Stefan Kena Cohen um, on the experimental aspects. So here is the uh, three layered structure that we created. Uh, this is just a, a reflectivity on the bottom DBR where you can see the two states. Um, and here is the experimental data. So this is my now n equal to 2s state, not the 1s state. The 1s state is going to be at a much lower energy. And now what I do is I decrease the temperature and as I decrease the temperature, the exciton moves up and it starts crossing the cavity mode. And then at 15 Kelvin, you can actually see the splitting of the modes. The line width of each of these is about eight, uh, it's about four MeV. And then once we get these um, structures, you can see the 
um, clearly what is happening. So you can see the two bands that are formed here, which is at low pump power. And then as I start driving the system, the system goes from a strongly coupled state to where the Rabi splitting is decreasing and decreasing and almost uh, you cannot discern it where you have pumped it so hard. So this decrease, now you've got to an extreme nonlinear case where you've got to the weak coupling regime. But however, we can look at the linear regime as to what is happening. So that's exactly what we do. We, we trace the upper branch and the lower branch as a function of pump power. And you can see that the upper and lower branches um, have this trend where they're starting to close up. Now, if I look at just the linear part of the spectrum where I don't worry about this closing, there are still polaritons inside the system, but what is happening now is that the uh, polaritons, uh, the Rab to overall Rabi splitting is decreasing. And so what we have done now is we have modeled this Rabi splitting in the, in the presence of N uh, carriers as a function of the initial Rabi splitting multiplied by some area. So you can see here that the Rabi splitting this is a normalized Rabi splitting. And the, the reason we do normalized Rabi splitting is because uh, when you have a Rabi splitting for 2S, it is smaller than that for 1S. So we need to really do it normalized to that value. And you can see if you do 2S versus 1S, you can see a clear difference in the blockade radius. So it's just extracted from the slope. And the blockade radius for the two is about a factor of four. In fact, if you just take the um, ratio of the bore radii, which have actually now been experimentally measured, by the group of Scott Kruger and Alexei Chernikov and others. Uh, the bore radius for the 2S and 1S have been experimentally determined to be 6.6 .6 and 1.7 nanometers, giving you about four. In other words, the ratio of the interaction strengths for 2S to 1S is about 16. And that agrees exactly with what we are seeing experimentally. So this is a proof of concept to show that going to these higher excited states, one can actually get higher interaction strengths. And this is one way to increase extra, uh, interaction strength. I must point out that there are two recent works, one that just got published in F Physical Review X, and the other one is on the archive, uh, both of which use, um, in one case, what is called the trions, and the other case, the Fermi polarons, uh, but essentially charged entities to increase the overall uh, nonlinearity of the system. Professor? So what we have taken is a different approach, where we have taken the Professor? Rydberg states, or the excited states, and just shown that you can increase no. the overall interaction strength. Yes. Uh, we have one uh, question from the audience. Yes. Professor Guay. Hi, hey, Rina. Uh, I have a question. So would the interaction and also the closing up of the Rabi splitting depend on the tunia? How does that affect, affect your, your results? So um, we have not, um, so we have done it at two different temperatures, but the, and in the linear regime, the results we get are similar. So how fast you're closing and opening does depend on the uh, detuning, um, but the in the linear part, the slope seems to be similar. But we, we, were, we don't have multiple samples with different detunings to test this, so we haven't uh, done that. Okay, thank you. So in the last um, five minutes, I want to uh, talk about some very recent results which are unpublished. So there is this idea of valley coherence. So like valley polarization, you can also have um, an idea called valley coherence where you come with a linearly polarized light. And if you come with a linearly polarized light, you populate both the valleys. And so the light that comes out has the same linear polarization as the excitation uh, beam. And this is what has been called as valley coherence. Um, it has also been studied in the context of bilayers where you can't really call it valley coherence, but it is really um, because you have, uh, two layers. And so the idea of valley is not really a valid argument here. But nevertheless, the linear polarization that you're using to excite is preserved more in the case of the bilayer system. And this has to do with the interplay between the layer uh, degree of freedom, the valley degree of freedom, and the spins of the states. And this was reported in this um, article in uh, 2014 that the bilayers actually show a higher, um, what they call valley coherence, but what I would call preservation of linear polarization. So what we wanted to ask was, what happens in polaritons? And in polaritons, there is a really nice aspect here, which is if you take a regular uh, cavity, um, like the ones that we use, there is a TTM splitting of the modes. 
And this TETM splitting has been investigated at great detail by multiple co-authors like Shalik and Kavokin and others, um, where they've studied what happens because of this TETM splitting on the polariton states. And the idea of an optical spin hall effect has been proposed. So essentially the TETM splitting results in an effective magnetic field, which um, in this case, this is the TETM splitting for the photons. This is the, for the exciton, which um, for the K vectors that we are interested in is almost negligible. So it's really dominated by this aspect. And what this results in is an effective magnetic field, which now has this property that the, so the, the yellow line is the, uh, the effective magnetic field and the red and the blue are the polariton pseudo spins um, as they process along this uh, KX, KY plane. So what we wanted to ask was, will this, can one exploit this to somehow manipulate this valley coherence property? So here is our experimental data. So what we look at is we come in with a linearly polarized light. We look at the polariton emission and we ask the question, what is the degree of linear polarization of this light that is coming out? And what is plotted here is this degree of linear polarization as a function of in-plane momentum. And I, I, if you can recollect, as I increase the in-plane momentum, I'm going to make the system more exciton-like um, as I go to larger K values. And as I go to larger K values, this, what happens now is it becomes more exciton-like. Um, the TETM splitting becomes larger, as you can see. And because the TETM splitting becomes larger, it is as if a greater magnetic field is acting on the system. And hence, your line, uh, this polariton pseudo spin rotates even more. And in fact, that is what is shown here, how you can rotate the uh, pseudo spin. It gets to the maximum rotation at about 45 degrees, returns back to the uh, original state, and then back to original, again, back to original state when you get back to 180 degrees. All I'm trying to emphasize here is that you, one can use this photonic bands in the system to now manipulate the valley properties of these TMDs um, by strongly coupling them to uh, coupling the excitons in the 2D materials to the cavity photons in these uh, systems. This work was spearheaded by Mandeep, um, who is a graduate student in my group, and Nicholas Yama, who, is a, uh, who was a summer REU student who worked uh, in our group uh, to do these measurements. And of course, always the longstanding question is, uh, you know, anytime with these systems is, can we get condensation? And I want to give you a little bit of, uh, uh, in some sense, some preliminary results where we don't have condensation, but we, I want to just report what we are seeing here. So this is a cavity at low temperature where we are seeing the two polariton branches nicely. Um, and the line width is about eight milli electron volt. And you can see here the PL, and you can also see the trion, uncoupled trion emission. What is shown here is as a function of pump power, what happens? So you can see that at large pump powers, the emission is more focused on some larger K values. And as I get to higher pump powers, my K value emission gets more dominant and the trion emission also gets reduced at larger pump powers. So it appears that the polariton scattering to K equal to zero is actually um, enhanced as I get to larger pump powers. So the structure we used in these experiments was just a bottom mirror, a silicon uh, nitrate silicon dioxide DBR, um, uh, a, a layer of tungsten sulfide between boron nitrate and just a silver mirror. The Q of this cavity is not great. It's about 200. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we see, start seeing some evidence of this. I also put, a, put this graph here just to show uh, what is the kind of density that is predicted theoretically to get condensation in these systems. What we can plot is we can take line cuts at k equal to zero, k equal to 20 degrees and so on as a function of log uh, of the power that you're putting in. And this is actually room temperature data, which actually shows us that as they go to larger pump powers, the area under the curve gets higher, much higher for the, remember this is a log plot. It gets much higher for the K equal to zero compared to 20 degrees. So already we are seeing an evidence of more polaritons getting formed at K equal to zero compared to larger K, indicative of some kind of a bosonic stimulation that is causing this process. This is again work in progress. It's in collaboration with Jim Hohn's group, but again, it was led by Jay and Mandeep who did uh, these experiments and this work in progress, but currently held on, uh, put on hold because of uh, the crisis that we are going through. So just to summarize, um, these are the kind of things that we have talked about, uh, the valley polarization properties, the electrical control, the 
formation of polaritons with excited states and their increased nonlinearities and the control of the valley pseudo spin by effectively engineering the photonic band structure and strongly coupling them to the excitons. I want to spend the last two minutes just showing some outlook. Um, where are we going? What can be done with these systems? So, at a fundamental level, there's a lot of interest in uh, twist. Professor, of twisting. Yes. Yeah, uh, we have one question. Yes, go ahead. Well, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I had a question going back to the um, to the uh, Rydberg excitons and yes. the way they couple. Okay. So, just try to understand. So you were saying that the interaction strength is larger for higher lying states, but the Rabi splitting is smaller, correct? Yes. So what do you, um, I have a very naive understanding of this. I would always yeah. imagine the interaction strength to be proportional to the Rabi splitting. Yes, but that's the uh, interaction strength of n number of carriers, right? So it goes as square root of n times the total number of uh, the interaction strength per exciton. Right. Correct? Right. Now, to begin with, the oscillator strength of the 2s is 10 times weaker than the 1s. Right. Right? The question that one needs to ask is, given a Rabi splitting, even if it is small, right, how much, how, ma how many, ideally, in the, in the quantum um, limit or the polariton blockade limit, what you want is an addition of one extra polariton to shift your energy by one line width, right? Right. So we are not there any, anywhere close to that. We are far away from that. We, are putting, we need to put, and our line widths are too large. But it doesn't matter even if the line, if the, uh, if the Rabi splitting is small, because what we are really looking at is a normalized value. We are dividing it by the Rabi splitting at zero uh, density or very low density, right? So this graph is omega n divided by omega naught, where omega naught is the Rabi, it's the, effective change in the Rabi splitting normalized with respect to the Rabi splitting at low, at, you know, close to zero pump power. I see. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. So um, just a quick outlook, um, you know, there's been a lot of work on being able to twist these 2D materials. And I think this is a very exciting area where one can start thinking about realizing a collection of polaritons all periodically aligned, uh, but inside a cavity, we saw some preliminary results on this direction from uh, Hui Deng's group uh, last week. Um, the other interesting thing about 2D materials is that uh, the exciton binding energy um, and the oscillator strength are all dependent on the dielectric interface that they are in contact with. So one could start envisioning making substrates that are patterned, which will now modify the net exciton energy at each of these locations. A second uh, thing I want to throw out there is there has been a lot of interest in polariton circuits, um, but this is a picture that I've uh, borrowed from the Mikhail Lipson's group where they had a recent paper um, in uh, Nature Photonics where they showed a modulator, but that was not in the strong coupling limit. But one could conceive of realizing strong coupling in cavity systems, which are integrated with planar photonic devices and essentially realize use polaritons or use 2D materials only in the regions where you want polariton nonlinearities and at the rest of the time have the information passing as photons. In other words, you don't need to etch a whole cavity system down, but you can make a silicon photonic device, a silicon nitride photonic device, and then integrate it with these um, 2D materials and realize polaritonic nonlinearity and polaritonic circuits. So what I want to then conclude with is that, you know, we've been able to see plasmon polaritons, phonon polaritons, and exciton polaritons in these systems. There might also be possibilities to see these other kinds, which are pretty exotic and will be very interesting to study. With that, I want to thank my research group um, who made this all happen. Um, and the amazing students, postdocs, undergraduate students, uh, all involved in the various aspects of these projects. Uh, this is a photo taken before we sh New York City shutdown, um, where we used to have good times uh, going out for dinner. And with that, these are some relevant publications from my group, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Binot, for this nice talk. So as was, I, I was explaining at the beginning of this webinar series, uh, at the end, uh, we allocate a 
a few minutes just for a Q&A Q &A section, for an Q&A section. So we have one by, uh, from Brian Kudish, which says, is the EQE of the polariton LED lower than that of the LED of the pure material only? Does this, yes. imply, does this imply that there are additional non-radiative decay pathways to the ground state with the addition of light matter coupling? Well, I hate to make a comparison between our LED and the best LEDs people have made because we were not, we are really not an LED group. Um, this was more of an effort to see if we can electrically inject carriers into these devices. Uh, but at least the numbers that we got, which is 110 to the minus three, is not as good as uh, uh, the other polariton LEDs that have been reported. Okay, thank you. And we have a final question from the audience. Mm -hmm. Yes, Said, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Vinod, for a very nice and interesting talk. Um, I have I have a question about this uh, uh, Rydberg states in the yes. context of uh, nonlinear optics, right? Which is yes. the uh, the, uh, the where the interest comes from. Yes. So, if I recall correctly, you say that the that the Bohr radius for the s equals one was somewhere between one and two nanometers or? Yeah, it's about 1.7 nanometers. 1.7, yes. Yeah. So basically, uh, so gallium arsenide, to, to put the context, uh, yeah. or radius about 10 nanometers, right? 10 yes. Four. So to, to have an exciton in this TMD that is bigger than the one in gallium arsenide, you need to go to S equals three. Yes. But to go to S equals three, you need to cool it below gallium arsenide. So then the whole motivation of, you know, uh, uh, these materials with a large oscillator strength and large binding energy just goes away because in fact, the, the interesting excitons, which are the highly excited ones, are the ones that only survive at low temperatures because they have small binding energies. These are the highly excited states. So exactly. I'm trying to- Yes, to, no, to Sorry, you have a very, you have a, you have a valid point in that, that, um, you know, if I need to start uh, thinking about uh, numbers where uh, you can compare to gallium arsenide, then you need to go to ends that are at least 3s, for example, right? Um, yes. My point here is that you can, one, it's, e it's easier to access these excited states in the system. So even if I go to low temperature, right? And even if I do it at uh, temperatures below what is done in gallium arsenide, but Already, there are experiments that have shown up to 5S, right? Where by the time you get to 5S, you're doing much better than gallium arsenide. I'm not saying that 2S is the, uh, uh, is the answer here, because obviously with 2S, we are, all we are showing is that we can get the scaling, right? But if I want to get to something really uh, at the blockade limit, I need to go to probably to the 5S. So that's more of a technical challenge, Syed. So this is a very valid question. I agree with you. But I think my point is that it's not enough to stick to 2S or 3S, but you probably want to get to numbers like 5. Yes. And, um, and that has been shown, at least experimentally, there are multiple groups that have seen up to 5S uh, in these systems if you go to low temperature. So I don't yes. think temperature is really, you know, I, I hate to... Uh, no, I completely agree with you. But yeah. I, th I think my, my, my point is that, uh, you know, um, the, the, the motivation for the, I, I, I find the, the perspective of, of uh, the highly excited states, you know, very interesting regardless of the temperature. But yes. I think that, that the motivation of, let, let's say, putting these, the TMDs in the context of, you know, they're interesting because of the uh, temperature, uh, you know, the high oscillator strength and the... the... No, no, no. Syed, you're absolutely right. Yeah, in the you, you see what this, I mean? Yeah, because in, in the end... In the case of this... Like I said, I, in the case of Rydberg um, uh, nonlinearities, I'm not flaunting anything about room temperature, um, and I don't think anyone should. It's not about that. It's about the fact that you can actually access these higher excited states. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. In, uh, compared yeah. to the cuprous oxide kind of systems, at actually reasonable temperatures. So even at four Kelvin, people can see up to five S, right? So it's a, it's all it's also a question of material challenges, but. I think that you're absolutely correct about that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Anyways, thank you, it's, it's yeah. very, very, very interesting, this, this results. And yeah, I look forward to, to see if uh, you can go up the ladder. Huh? It would be, it would be uh, great. We'll see. <laughs>
Thanks, Ian. All right, so it seems that we are a little bit over time, but uh, Professor, if you agree, there is one final. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I can stick around, that's not a problem. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Matt, go ahead. All right, so regarding your results of the um, effective magnetic field that you saw with the, yep. in, the TETM splitting, I mean, does that depend on the valley polarization of your materials or can you also do this experiment with organic materials? Uh, come again so uh regarding the you know the results you show with the spin polarization right i mean can you do the same similar experiment with the organic materials or does it depend on the valley polarization so what we are doing here material? is we're exploiting the valley property right so the excitons themselves have a valley property and then we are trying to superimpose on that the tatm splitting to manipulate that valley property mm, oh okay so our, what i'm trying to get it is we, what, once you have the strong coupling and polariton physics involved, one could use the band structure of the photonic component to affect what happens at the exito to the excitonic properties, degree of freedom. Oh, okay. So similar to what the lot of work that is happening on polariton lattices from the group of Jacqueline Block and Alberto Amo and um, Sven Hoffling and Sebastian Klemt and others where they made polariton lattices where now uh, the lattice is done at the length scale of the photon to now manipulate the polariton. So for example, the polariton topological insulator that was realized, right? So there it was the photonic band structure that was manipulated. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. All right, it seems that we have reached the, the end of uh, our webinar. So professor, could you please stop sharing your screen? Yes. All right. <clears throat> so thank you, Professor Binot, for the interesting Yes, talk. and actually, um, uh, Luis, I see that there are a lot of questions which I haven't been able to follow, but um, if you can send me a notes on this, I'm happy to answer to people uh, set offline. Oh yeah, of course. So yeah, we'll so figure out a whole how bunch to... of questions. Yeah. I see that. yeah. Okay. So, and yeah, and as I was saying, on behalf of the audience, I'm, um, the Xion and Yuan Shu groups. Uh, we sincerely appreciate you being part of this webinar series. So today we hosted, uh, so right now there are 150 people uh, online, at, uh, but at some point we reach, we, we reach uh, 220. So it's, it's good to see that people is interested in this kind of ideas. So just one quick announcement bef before we, we go. Okay. So, so um, we have uh, Professor Abraham Nitsan from the University of Pennsylvania uh, for our next um, webinar. So remember, remember to register at this link in case you, you wish to attend. And, and finally, I just want to say thank you to everyone for your attendance and stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye.